because in my heart I don't say I think I hope I say I know and you know there's another element in our lives that we don't think much about and that's the element of faith everything we do is by faith 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 everything when you sat in that chair had you ever sat in that chair before by faith you just sat down in it you had faith that people wouldn't build a chair that wouldn't hold you Everything we do is by faith. All right, take the same faith, put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will know who Jesus is. Again, we are in the book of James. We're going to start a brand new series called True Faith, and we're going to look at these five chapters, we're going to dig super, super deep. So this is going to take some time, and I'm really, really excited about it. So here's one thing. I'm going to ask everyone right, right up front, commit to this series. Commit to this series. It's going to be an amazing series as we jump through this and we see what James is all about. I believe God is going to grow us through this series. I also believe there will be trials as we enter into this series. I 100% believe that. We're going to talk about trials this morning, and it's so funny. The minute we start looking at the Word of God and we start talking about trials, trials come. Trials come because God wants, God wants to grow us. He wants to grow us, and that's the point of it. So we're going to look at that, what that means this morning. But the, the good thing about James is how practical this book is. It is not only practical, but it's powerful. Practical and powerful as we look at the book of James. We're going to talk about things that, that we go through on a daily basis. We're going to go through practical ways on how to fight against those things or have the strength, the courage, the, to be encouraged to continue on in our faith in Jesus Christ. Can we do that? We're going to do that this morning. We're going to take a look at it. But again, we're going to span the next nine to ten weeks looking into this book. And I believe God's going to do something absolutely incredible. So if you're here with me, open your Bibles, pull out your phones, whatever it is. Let's look at James chapter 1 and verse 1. It says this, James, a bond servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. And yes, we're going to stop right there. So James 1.1, 1, 1, what does he say? He says, James, a bondservant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at, I'm going to answer three questions right out of the gate. One, who is James? Who is James writing to? And why did James write this? I think it's very, very important that we understand who this book is written to. And first and foremost, that we understand who James is. Because we're going to hear some amazing things through this, but I want us to know who James is. So he, this is how he enters in and writes the beginning. He says, I'm a servant of God, is how he introduces himself. I love that. I'm a servant of God. A bond servant, a slave. He's saying, I'm for Jesus. This is who I am. Instead of introducing himself as Jesus' brother. So we find that he actually is Jesus' brother. Matthew 13, 55 says this. Is not this the carpenter's son? It's these people talking about Jesus. Is it not his mother called Mary? And not, are not his brothers James and Joseph, Simon and Judas? So again, he's a half-brother of Jesus, but James, right at first, here's what's so crazy about it, James didn't even believe in Jesus. He didn't even believe who Jesus was, and I find that very interesting. He's family. His family actually thought he was crazy. This is what's so interesting about this whole thing. His family thinks that he's crazy. In Mark 3, 21, we, we hear this. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. Jesus was doing something, and there's people all around. They heard what he was saying. It said his family heard it. They went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. They said he's out of his mind. Does anyone have a brother or sister that you believe that? 100% that they're out of their mind. There we go. We got a couple hands. A couple hands. So they believe out of his mind. Why, do, why, do they, why are they saying this? Well, imagine this. This is James, right? He grows up with Jesus. Jesus is doing these amazing things around him. He sees him doing these amazing things. But here's what he says. I'm God. He says, I'm God. So can you imagine the family at this point, right? 
Mary gets it, right? All of a sudden she's conceived by the Holy Spirit, this baby, right? Jesus. But then all of his brothers, those that are born, he's, he's, he's being raised and he's like, I'm God. And so can you imagine, right now, imagine your sibling. Imagine your sibling just being like, yeah, I, I'm God. How, I, I mean, how would you feel about that? How would you feel? You'd be like, he's out of his mind. He's crazy. Something's gone wrong. There's an issue here. Right? That, that's what's taking place. So when you think about this, again, James is a normal man, a normal human being. So he's hearing these things. He's seeing these things take place. And though they're amazing, right? The healing that happens, the healing that takes place amongst the times Jesus is scattered abroad. He's going around doing amazing miracles. James is probably thinking, look, I, I, I see it. I see it, but he's like, Jesus, this like, just looks like magic tricks to me, right? He, he doesn't believe it. He's not, he's not there. And so what's interesting, again, he's like, I, I think he's crazy. He's out of his mind. So again, I, I love that because we see the reality here. We see that James is real. Yes, church? We see that he's real. And many times we see this throughout Jesus' time on the earth. When he's doing these miracles, people saw them all day long. They saw these incredible things that take place. We were just in a series before this, and we talked that all of those things that Jesus did, we can't even write it in a book. We can't even write it in a book. Why? Because it's too much. It's too much. What he did for us and what he did for those people on the earth was too much. And that's what's crazy about it. So James didn't believe in Jesus. James didn't believe in Jesus until after Jesus' resurrection. Now, here's the difference, right? He's saying, I'm God. This is who I am, right? I have to go die on the cross for everyone's sins. But guess what? I'm going to come back three days later. So imagine this again. He's saying, I'm God. So his brother's like, okay. Then he's saying, I'm going to resurrect from the ground three days later. So again, can you imagine what's taking place with the family? Those some believed, some didn't. So then as he's raised from the grave, we just talked about this as we had resurrection day and Easter. He's raised from the grave and 1 Corinthians 15, 7 tells us this. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So he shows up to his brother. He shows up to his brother. So now we're thinking maybe James is like, what is going on here? And boom, Jesus appears. And now guess what? Everything changes. Everything changes. I love that. And we see, as we went through this, the, the 40 days that took place after, after uh, Jesus' resurrection that we just went through, we see that Jesus shows up to, to, to people, right? He's showing up to Thomas, the doubter. We talked about the doubter, that he gets claimed to be this doubter, right? And Jesus shows up to who? Him, specifically. Why? Because Jesus loves him. Jesus loves him and he cares for him, so he shows up to him and he says, Look, Thomas, it's me. See the scars in my hands, see the scars in my feet, see the scars in my side. I love that because many of you go, leave him alone. He's a doubter. Jesus shows up to the doubter. Amen? Jesus shows up to the doubter. So I love that. So again, he's showing up. He shows up to James. And then here's what's crazy about it. It's so impactful that James then becomes the leader of the church of Jerusalem. He becomes the leader of the church of the Jerusalem. This is, again, think about this. One who didn't believe at all. One who had, no, he had complete doubt. He didn't believe in his own brother. That he would claim to be God. That he would have to die and resurrect again. And now all of a sudden, James is now the leader of the church in Jerusalem. What a crazy change, right? That's encouraging to me because what it says is, though one time we doubted, guess what we can do for God? Amazing things. Amazing things we can do for Jesus. And so again, he now becomes the leader of the church of Jerusalem. Galatians 2.9 tells us this, Paul references James as a pillar that he was a pillar for the church. I love that. Because Paul knows who he is. He says, look, James is a pillar for the church. What he says is, James is a big deal. He did something for the glory of God. And God used him in an incredible way. Once, once again, once again, he was doubting. And now he plays a huge role in the church of Jerusalem. And not even that. In the whole entire church as it's spread abroad. So I love that we get to look at James and the history of what went through his mind being, being raised with Jesus and seeing everything he did and his thoughts on it. But as we do things for Christ, as he did things for Christ, we should know that trials will come. Anytime we step out in faith, any single time we step out in faith, and I, I want to see some hands in this, we know that there's trials ahead. Anytime you take that first step, we know that all of a sudden it gets crazy, yes? Yes? 
we know that it gets crazy. So when we want to do big things for Christ, church, let me tell you right now, there will be trials. There absolutely will be trials. You need to understand that it will not be easy at all. But here's the thing. We have Jesus that holds us. He will encourage us and he will get us through. As we don't, we don't have an account of James uh, in the Bible of how he died. There's no record in the Bible, but history tells us, the church history tells us, that James dies brutally. James' death, I'll give you a quick summary of this. The story is James is hated by the, the Pharisees that are in the area in Jerusalem because of his proclamation of Jesus, because he's preaching, 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 talking about Jesus and who he is and what he did. He's talking about him just like we are today. So the Pharisees hated that. They didn't like that. So what did they do? They went to him. They threw him off of the temple. He lands, is what, the, what church history says. He doesn't die, falling from that temple, however high that is. But here's, here's how it ends. He's then beaten with clubs. He's then beaten with clubs. And church history says that the last club that hit him right to the head split his head open. But here's what's so amazing about this. This man that was truly for Jesus, this man that was proclaiming who Jesus is, as he was beaten with clubs, they say he was praying out loud for those that are beating him. Talk about a heart after Jesus, yeah? As these people are beating him with clubs, He's praying out loud for these people that are beating him who would then become his killers, who then would, would kill him completely. And he's praying for them. Do we have that kind of heart? Take a look at our life. Take a look at the, the enemies, quote unquote, that we may have or those around us that cause so much trouble in our life or those that call trials in our life or those that, that hurt us, that are against us, right? As James is being beaten, he's praying for those people. Can we do that? That's hard, yes? Do we agree? That would be so difficult. So difficult, but yet James is taking the beating and he's praying for these people that are completely against him and want him dead. I love that. I love to hear that, to see this man, the heart that he had for Jesus, but he truly showed who Jesus was in his life, praying for them as they're killing him. Amazing. So this is, this is who James is. And we're going to find out who was James writing to again. And we see that in verse 1. It says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Verse 1 tells us that. That the 12 tribes were scattered. This would be Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel. Christian Jews who were there. And also, why it says scattered. That word scattered there, it means in the dispersion. In the dispersion. Because what's taking place is this. In Acts, as we see the church begin and we see the Holy Spirit fall upon them, guess what was taking place? We read about it, right? That thousands of people were coming to Christ. Thousands of people's lives were being changed immediately. And as Paul and, and those men are speaking, right? It's changing languages. And when they speak, everyone understands it, though there's many different languages taking place. So we can see that the Holy Spirit was doing something incredible there. And what's happening is people are giving their lives over to Christ. And whenever there is something big that happens for the Lord, you better believe that there's trials headed their way. So again, that word scatter there means in the dispersion. And what happens is this. The first, the first thing we see is a man named Stephen. Stephen gets killed. He gets stoned. And he was a Christian man. He loved Jesus. He spoke about Jesus. And what happened is Stephen was stoned to death. Acts 8 says that it led to the great dispersion. It led to the great persecution of the church. So Stephen dies. He gets stoned. And what happens is Christians now are afraid. And so they spread out in the dispersion because they're being persecuted. So we see a great persecution come upon the church. And now they're spread. But here's the great thing. Just because they're spread, that's not a bad thing. Because as they spread out, guess what happens? The gospel begins to be spread. The gospel begins to be spread. So again, we, we look at this idea, man, this is a terrible thing. Absolutely not. Stephen knew what he was getting into. He knew it. And I guarantee you the same thing's taking place with him. Where he's there praying for those people. Where he's ready to go. He's like, if this is the way out, this is the way out. I'm going. I'm going to go home be with my father. I'm going to go home. That's where I'm headed. And so again, as that takes place, the great dispersion happens because of that persecution. But it's a good thing because then the gospel can be spread. And that's what we want, the gospel to be spread. But I love it because again, it's not a bad thing. We don't look at it as a bad thing. We say, yes, Lord, you had to do this so that way the Christians can scatter and they can go preach the gospel to all the land that's nearby. 
And there, therefore, the gospel being preached forward. So who are they writing to again? These 12 tribes that are scattered. And then the last question here, why did James write this? And this should encourage every single person in this room. Every single person should be encouraged by this next thing. Why did James write this specifically? Because these people were dealing with these problems. The problems that we're going to be talking about throughout all of James were the same problems that they were dealing with at that same time. Why does that encourage me? Because it makes me realize the same thing was taking place there and then as the same things are taking place now. The same problems that we deal with on a regular basis. On a regular basis. It shows me these people were human. And a lot of these people were there for Jesus. A lot of them. And they dealt with the same issues that we're dealing with today. That encourages me. Because it goes, thank you Lord. That someone else has dealt with this. And not just me. It's awesome to see these people go through this. Because he's going to discuss it. This, this should encourage us again that these people were dealing with those things. But again, that shows us that this book is so practical. So practical. We'll see some things that, that he's dis discussing. is Impatience and difficulties. Talking the talk but not walking the walk. No control over the tongue. Anyone have a problem with that? That's something big, right? Some of you, yeah? Man, I love that you're truthful and honest, church. Let's be real. Let's be real. Seriously, let's be real. No control over the tongue. Fighting amongst each other. Oh, that doesn't happen in church. Are you kidding? Right? Fighting amongst each other, sister against sister, brother against brother, brother against sister, right? It happens. It's so interesting because I got four kids. You guys might know that. I have four kids and me and my wife were talking the other day. We're like, man, our older two just, keep, they just are like this all the time now. All the time. Noah's 10, Isley's 6, and all the time they are just butting heads. I'm like, what took place? What took place is this. They're getting older. They're getting older. That's what happens with siblings. Anyone, a sibling, they fought with their sibling all the time, always nagging, right? Isley comes in, Noah's doing this to me, and he goes, no, I'm not, and he, he is. Well, I'm not meaning to, and then he smirks and he walks away. He knows what he's doing. He absolutely knows what he's doing, but that's, that's the church. Sometimes we're like that towards each other. Sometimes we're so close that we just want to fight with each other for whatever reason it is. But that was taking place then. Again, that there's fighting amongst the church. There's fighting amongst the people. Another thing is coveting. And the last thing we're going to look at is materialism. Materialism. Things that we want, things that we desire. We want to buy a new car. We want to buy a new house. We want to buy this. We want to buy that. Those are things that we deal with, yes? Trust me, I like new clothes. I like glasses. It's great. But how much money am I spending on this stuff? I shouldn't be doing that, right? You, you look at something new, right? Me and Colin were talking about shoes lately. And, and we don't want to talk about his thing on shoes, but we're talking about shoes, right? Buying Nikes or whatever it is. Materialism sometimes, that we, 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 we want these things so bad, so bad, we'll do anything to get them. And so we got to be careful for those things. But these, are these not practical things that we're going to be talking about? They're absolutely practical, and I love it because we can grow in them, and we will discuss all of these things. If we are real, I believe that all of these things will profit us if we're real. We got to look at this thing, everything we're looking through in James. We got to look at it, our life and go, am I dealing with this? Is this something that's in my life? How do I remove it, or how do I get better at it, or how do I get closer to Jesus? If we're real, I believe everything we're going to speak about will profit us. Profitability is key. So today, if you're taking notes today, the title of the message is profitability, and here's why. Here's why. Because when we take a look at trials, or we take a look at good times, or whatever it is, everything that we go through, profitability. Everything that we go through, we can profit from. So what you're thinking, what are you talking about, right? When you think about profitability, maybe it's money. You talk about finances. If you're in business, right? The idea of a business is that it would be profitable. If it's not profitable, it's not going to be a business long. Not going to be a business long. But you look at everything in your life, you can profit from everything, even the trials. Why? Because in the trials, what you profit is growth. In the trials, what you profit is you're, you have a closer relationship with Jesus because you're on your knees constantly crying out. In anything that you do, there's profitability, even in the bad and even in the good. So we need to look at it that way and go, wow. Instead of looking at the trial and go, this is the worst thing in my life. This is absolutely chaotic. I'm done. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Look at it and go, God, how can you grow me? Lord, as I'm going through this trial, what, what do you want me to profit? How can I grow from this? And so we need to look at it that way and change our mindset. 
Not come in, I get it, things are hard, but not come in, poor me, poor me. Go, Lord, how can I grow through this trial? Can we do that, church? How can we grow and grow closer in our faith with Jesus? How can we grow in our lives and not go, oh, everything's a mess and everything's a disaster, but go, Lord, what do you want me to learn through this? What can I profit through it? So again, if you're taking notes, profitability. Let's jump back in James chapter 1, verse 2. And let's read. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So again, let's read that again, because I know it's a hard verse to understand, and we do not want to count it all joy. But he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why is he speaking this? Because they're going through a trial. They're going through trials. So he's saying, count it all joy that you are going through this. Why? Because knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. You hear that? Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So again, when we look at verse 2, it's probably not exciting for everyone. It's, as he's saying, my brethren, count it all joy when you're going in various trials. And you may be asking, what does various mean here? What is very? That means everything. That means everything. It's various. It can mean anything. So when you're going through various trials, he's saying count it all joy. With, with some hands really quick, how many of you want to count it all joy when you go through those trials? Yeah? Great. The rest of you are like, no way. No way. I see David laughing. <laughs> no way. We don't want to count it all joy, right? That's the hardest thing to do. It's like, oh, you, you, you wake up, you go out of bed, and there's a trial, boom, trial place in front of you. You're like, yes! Absolutely what I wanted to do this morning was go through a trial. I'm just in awe, Lord. This is amazing, right? We don't, we don't normally, that's not our, our reaction to a trial. That generally is never a reaction to the trial, right? But James says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you go through various trials. Here's what's so interesting about this. He says when, not if. He says when, not if. So you're thinking, oh, I just, I could slide by this, right? But if we go through various trials, he says, when you go through various trials. That means they will come, church. They will absolutely come. It's when they come, count it all joy. When they come, look unto Jesus, right? So again, it's not if, it is when. When you fall into various trials. Here's what's interesting. It says, count it all joy. Again, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Turn the trial into triumph. Turn that trial into triumph. So we're thinking, we got to count it all joy. But that's, that's the essence there is. You know what, Lord? I'm going to take this trial. I'm going to turn it into triumph. Why? Because this trial can be defeated. It can be won. I can grow through this. It is something that I can walk away from and go, I had triumph in this trial. I hope that is our heart this morning. That when we go through those trials, that's the first thing we think of. Is I'm going to turn this into a triumph. Why? Because of Jesus and Jesus alone. That that is possible to do. It is possible to turn that trial into a triumph. There is victory in Jesus Christ. Amen, church? There's victory in him. In 1 Peter 4.12, it says this. Beloved, this is us. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. So he's saying this. Don't be surprised. Don't be like, oh, uh, I didn't expect this. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. <laughs> I love that. He's saying don't be surprised when that trial comes, that fiery trial hits you as though something weird is happening. You're like, oh, all of a sudden there's a trial. Oh, all of a sudden I'm trying to grow closer to Jesus. Life just got harder. Right? There's a trial that just hit me. That's going to happen. It's going to take place. He's saying, don't be surprised by it. But in verse 13, he says this, but rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's suffering. Rejoice when you go through those trials as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Why do we rejoice in those trials? Because then we can share alongside Christ's suffering, but also rejoice in the fact that here, guess what? 
There's going to be glory for Jesus in that trial. There's glory in it for Jesus. That's the point here is we can rejoice. Why? And be glad because this will reveal God's glory. When people look at your life and you're going through the hardest times ever, when you're going through those trials and God does an amazing work in your life, an amazing work through that trial, at the end of the trial, you get to look back and you go, Lord, you are so good. And I just want to share you and give you all the glory. That's what we should be doing with those trials. That's what we should be doing at the end of those hard times is pointing it all back to Jesus and go, you know what got me through? It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Because again, there is victory in Jesus. So beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange is happening. But rejoice as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I hope that is our heart this morning, church that we would do this as we continue on, that we would point all the glory and praise to Jesus. And here's the, the idea of that again, is instead of being a victim, become the victor. Instead of being the victim, become the victor. There's victory again in Christ. So again, when you come through those trials and you say, look, I'm done with this, or you, you feel like the victim and, you, and, and you're just stuck, remind yourself there's victory in it. Remind yourselves that you can become the victor and you can conquer that trial because you can turn that trial into triumph with Jesus. You can. In verse three, it goes on. So he says again, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And there's so many things that could go into the various trials. But verse three he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There, there is profitability in this, right? So as we go through those various trials, we should know that the testing of your faith, because that's what happens when you go through trials, you get tested, your faith is now tested. Is your, is your faith bulletproof, right? Is your faith strong in Jesus? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces something, there is profitability. It produces patience. It produces endurance. There's many things that you will receive from that. Knowing that there is profitability, it will produce something. These tests prove that our faith is genuine. It absolutely proves that our faith is genuine. Because when the boat is being rocked, who are you looking to? When the boat is being rocked, are you saying, I can do this. I can do this. Anyone been there? I got this, Lord. It's all good. I can totally do this. And that, that boat is rocking like crazy. And you realize the next thing you know, you're off the side of the boat. You're off the side of the boat. Because you tried to handle it yourself. You tried to go, Lord, I got it. No worries. I can handle this thing myself. And he's just saying, are you kidding? I got it for you. Let me do it. Let me. And we'll, we'll understand what that means in a little bit, but surrendering. So again, know that there's profitability, that, that those tests prove that your faith is genuine. That though things get crazy and life is hard and life is tough and the boat is being rocked, that you're still looking towards Jesus Christ. You're still looking towards Jesus in those trials. Instead of getting mad and saying, why, Lord? Why am I going through this? You just go, Lord, teach me. Teach me. It's interesting when things get good. So interesting. I've seen this in my own life. When things get good, we tend to do this. And we fall away from the Lord. Why? Because everything's great. Why do we need Him? Everything's so good. And then every now and then we're going, praise Jesus. <laughs> right? It's just a simple thing like that. We're not spending time with Him. Great. We're not in a real relationship with Him. But we go, oh, Jesus, you're amazing. You're amazing. All right, I'm going to continue on now. And then every now and then, oh, Jesus, you're amazing. And continue on. Right? Because things are good. Why do you need Him? Right? And that's what happens. And then all of a sudden the trial comes. And guess what? Are you kidding me, God? Are you serious? I have to go through this? Why are you doing this to me? And all of a sudden it shifts and it blames. Because at first it's all about me. I got this. Things are good. Why did I get that raise? Oh, because of me. Why did I get that new car? Because of me. The new house? Because of me. The spouse? Because of me. I'm awesome. I'm so awesome. And then boom, trial. And you're going like, okay, I realize that I'm not awesome. And here's what's interesting. But again, we may say that, but we're pointing everything towards Jesus going, it's your fault that I'm going through this. Why are you putting me through this? Why are you doing this to my life? Why are you doing this to my family? And all of a sudden we blame shift and we say, it's all because of you that things are horrible, God. It's all because of you that my life is terrible and it sucks. It's all because of you. And we get mad and we get upset about it. Instead of going, Lord, thank you for the trial. 
how can I profit from this? What can I learn through this? Change your mindset on it, church. Change your mindset on it. Look at the trial. Turn it into a triumph. Because you can with Jesus and Jesus alone. But know that there's profitability and that that's what he's saying. Count it all joy. And know that the testing of your faith produces something. It will produce patience. These trials help us mature. I know they're hard to go through. I know they're difficult at times. I know at times you just go, I want to give up completely. But they mature us in our relationship with Jesus. They mature us in our own life. They mature in life in general. When you go through those times of, of uh, those hard times or those difficulties, you learn from it. It's maturity that takes place. Maybe you made a bad decision in some area and that caused the trial. Maybe the trial just randomly came, whatever it is. There's maturity in it because you're going to learn something through it. You will. You absolutely will. I'll tell you this. I had no idea how to raise kids at all. Still, still working through that. But, it, but, but it's the hardest thing we've ever dealt with as a family. Just because kids are hard. Anyone with kids? They're difficult, right? They're difficult. Every time we enter into a new age, it's like, well, we've never seen this before. Noah's going to be 10. I've never had a 10-year-old. So I'm going to enter into new ways of, guess what? Maturity. Maturity. It's new ways of maturity. It's not that everything has to be perfect. It's not that I would learn exactly every single thing and the next time I go through it, it's going to be perfect. No, but there's maturity in it. So then when my, my daughter is 10, I can kind of see, okay, we went through some similar things here. So I've learned a little bit here, right? I've learned a little bit as she's been raised and, and is now 10. So we learn those things through it, whether it's a job, friendship, family, relationships. You're going to learn from the past things that you've dealt with. You may not look at it that way, but maybe you've been in a relationship one time and it was horrible. And everything in the relationship was terrible. Where well, you're going to learn next time, right? You're going to know, I probably shouldn't do that again. Yes, I probably shouldn't do that again. That's what happens because, again, you learned. And you can turn that trial into a triumph. So they mature us. The tests don't work against us. Hear this out, church, really, really, really quick. Those tests, those various trials, those things that come against us, they don't, they don't work against us, they work for us. And I know that may be hard to hear. They do not work against us, they work for us. Those things are for us to learn and mature and grow closer to Jesus. And grow closer to Jesus. You better believe, if Jesus is in the front and center, you better believe this is a trial. Why? Because that trial is going to put you right on your knees. That trial is going to put you right on your knees, praising Jesus and praying and calling out to his name. And I love it, because it's going to put you right in your place. And sorry if that's harsh, but that is the truth. It will put you in your place that you need to be surrendered and, and, and put all of your glory and praise towards Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. They mature us. Again, those tests don't work against us. They work for us. In Romans 5, 3, it says this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So again, we hear that same thing. It produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Hope in who? Hope in Jesus. That's what it is. So again, read that again. Not only that, but we rejoice in suffering. I know that's hard. Rejoice in the suffering, the times of sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So again, we go through those trials, it produces patience. It produces endurance. Why? Because then we can continue on in life. We have endurance to get through because we've been through trials that we felt like if we've been knocked down, right? But we get back up because of Jesus. So again, endurance. We see that. Then endurance produces what? Character. How many of you want better character? How many of you want to grow in your maturity and in your character? There's a reason why we go through these things. So again, it produces something. Produces character and then character produces hope. And he goes on to say that we have hope in Jesus. It produces hope. And we find that in Christ alone. So know that there's profitability. Counted all joy. And in verse 4, it says this. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So again, it's saying, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. This is what's interesting. I hate the word patience. I'm just going to be real honest with you guys. I absolutely hate that word. Patience. And guess who, who else hates the word? My kids. Right? And, and we're like that. But here's what's interesting. When I tell my kids to be patient, it reminds me of, guess who? Me. 
me. Because I say, you need to be patient. No. You need to be patient. I don't want to. You need to be patient. No way. Right? That's the response of a child. You need to wait. I'm hungry. You need to wait. I'm hungry. Right? Th those are those conversations that take place. But here's what's interesting. That's me and God. He's saying, patience, David. I'm saying, no way. He's saying, patience, David. I'm saying, I want to run. He's saying, patience, David. I'm like, I don't have this within me. That's the truth. That's our hearts. We don't want to wait. We want to keep going. But what's interesting is that it produces patience as we go through those trials. Why? Because we have to wait on the Lord. We have to wait on the Lord as we go through those trials. Because you're thinking, Lord, why am I going through this? Right? You ain't going to know the answer until the trial's over. And guess what? When the trial's over, it's an amazing answer. It's amazing because you see the ways that you needed to grow in your life, the ways that you needed to mature in your life. So we count it all joy, knowing that it's going to produce something. And we let it do its work. So it says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete and perfect, lacking nothing. Here's what's interesting. Let it do what it's supposed to do. Let it do what it's supposed to do. You want to fight it? You want to be against it? Let it do what it's supposed to do. It's going to do something in your life that produces something. Again, profitability. But here's, here's the other thing. When we let it do what it's supposed to do, what we're saying is, Lord, I surrender to your will. I surrender to your will. That's what we're doing. When we let it do what it's supposed to do, we're saying, God, I'm surrendering this trial to you. I'm surrendering this time of my life to you because I don't know how to deal with this. So I need to surrender it to you and let patience have its perfect work. So that way, what? I don't lack anything. So it matures me. It does what it's supposed to do. Let it do. Put your faith and trust in him. Let God do what he needs to do to mature you. Let him do it. I know it's hard, church, but let him do it so you can have maturity in your life. So it can produce something. And we need to build that character. Why? So we can be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. But you can't do this if we don't surrender our will to him. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, Humble yourselves therefore unto the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. He may exalt you at the perfect timing of those things. That's the trial. We humble ourselves and we say, Lord, you know what? I'm going to let you do what you're going to do in my life. I'm going to surrender you to your will. I'm going to humble myself before you, Father, because I know at the proper time you will exalt me. You will teach me. You will make me understand what I needed through this trial. Though difficult, you have a plan in place for me. Realize that this morning. And the last thing here in verse 5, it says this. After, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. How many times do we not ask for wisdom? How many times when we go through the trials, we don't ask because we feel bad or we feel like we can't or we feel like he's not loving enough. He is loving enough. He just says, ask for that wisdom that you need. Ask for it. Ask for wisdom. Ask so you can navigate through the trial. If you're not asking the questions, if you're not going to God, He knows your heart, so He's hearing it. Just ask the questions that you need to ask Him. And specifically ask for wisdom. Why wisdom? So we can absolutely navigate through the trial the way that we need to. He's not just saying, hey, here's a trial, figure it out. He's saying, here's a trial. Grow and ask for wisdom so you know how to navigate through the trial. So you know how to get through it. Because at the end of it is maturity. At the end of it is growth. At the end of it is profitability for your life and your soul. So ask him for that wisdom so he can help you navigate through the trial. Don't ask to take the trial away. Warren Wiersbe says this, we need wisdom. So we will not waste the opportunities God is giving us to mature. Hear that again. We need wisdom so we will not waste the opportunity. So we wouldn't waste those trials. So we wouldn't waste those hard times. But we would see them as opportunities God is giving us to mature. Wisdom helps us understand how to use these circumstances for our good and God's glory. 
for our good and God's glory. It helps us understand how we do this. So next time you're in a trial, whether you're in it today or whether you're in it tomorrow, whether you just got out of one, remind yourself of that, that asking for wisdom produces something, that wisdom helps us understand how to use the circumstances, how to use the trial that we're facing, how to use the hard times that we're enduring for good, our good specifically, and for God's glory. For His glory. The four things we see here is count, that we would count it all joy, that we would know that there's profitability, that we would let God do what he's supposed to do in our life. But here's what's amazing about that. We don't just let it happen, we also ask for wisdom in the midst of that trial. So when that trial hits, remind yourself, Lord, I want to count it all joy. I want to turn this trial into a triumph. Lord, I know that there's something in, it, in this for me, for me to learn. I know that there's profitability. It will produce something. And Lord, I want to let you do what you're going to do. I want to surrender to your will in my life. I want to let this happen for your glory. And at the same time, Lord, I need to ask for wisdom so I can navigate through this trial, so I can understand how I get through it, so I understand the day-to-day -day and what it looks like, Lord, so you give me that wisdom that I need. And I'm not afraid to ask for those things. Church, do not be afraid to ask for it. He's good, amen?